Holy crap. How many interceptions can you drop? How awesome is Jackson Dart in the clutch? He is the most clutch quarterback maybe that Ole Miss has ever had. And I love dropped interceptions on drives going down to win the game because against LSU and AM, we were able to make that work for us. I am unbelievably excited. We're going to talk a little bit about everything. I'm a little bit disheveled because of all of the stuff that happened. But this is the Locked On Ole Miss Postcast. You are Locked On Ole Miss. Your daily podcast on the Ole Miss Rebels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Absolutely nuts stuff. And I do want to let everybody know that today's show is brought to you by the Game Time Ticking app. If you're new to Locked On, just go to the Game Time Ticketing app, sign up, and you get $20 off by using promo code Locked On Ole Miss. I hope everybody does that as well. I, my nerves are completely freaking shot. Just done. They're, they're just done with at the moment. So if I am a little bit all over the place, excuse me for that. Um, and if I'm a little bit behind getting things done, I apologize for that because I didn't have time to do any of my appreciate stuff because of the craziness that was actually happening in the football game. And we're going to get to the user questions and all that in a little bit. But first, I do want to present um, and what's going on. Share my screen a little bit. And. If you look at that, I'll turn the audio off on that because we don't want ESPN's audio. They're bad about that. And I'm going to make that full screen. So if you look at what's going on, Ole Miss, a 38-35 winner over the Texas A&M Aggies. And all in all, it was a good day. It generally was. Offensively, this is one of those games where me and Bill Flowers is going to take a victory lap. So everybody needs to get ready for that. We had the quick passes, all of that stuff that we have been preaching about since the LSU game. They came back when we faced a defensive line that is worthy of dealing with, and all of a sudden, the offense just looked unstoppable. The only team that could stop Ole Miss today was Ole Miss, and they did with penalties and things like that. Special teams, a problem for Ole Miss. Blocked field goal. The punt game was okay. At least at least Ole Miss um, could get away with that, but the blocked field goal, the touchdown coming back, it was a lot closer than it needed to be. Ole Miss completely dominated that first half of the game. Jackson Dart, 24-33, 387 yards, two touchdowns, no picks, an absolute leader. Once again, he gets the ball back with the game in the balance, and he leads Ole Miss 75-plus yards for the go-ahead touchdown. This is the most clutch, touch, clutch quarterback that Ole Miss has had, at least since Eli, maybe ever. And we talked about this game, how it was a legacy-type game for Jackson Dart, and this is absolutely the case. And this game is an example of how that legacy gets built. And now we're going to talk about what's coming next. And what's coming next is awesome. But Ole Miss is 8-1 and one for the second year in a row and the third time since like 1960 or something like that. It is a ridiculous thing. Quinshawn Judkins, 20, 23 carries, 102 yards, three touchdowns against the number one rush defense in the SEC. Trey Harris, an absolute man. Legit. 11 catches, 213 yards. He had back-to-back one-handed grabs. One of them was ruled incomplete, rightly so. But my goodness, I would not trade him for another receiver, including Marvin Harrison Jr. in college football. John Saunders had the pick. Um, Bentley had a decent kick return. Caden Davis had the kick block, which you kind of hate it for that. Frazier Mason, 43 yards a kick. Let's give the kid his flowers a little bit as well because that's a realistic thing. Now, I want to bring this up. Ole Miss had the ball for 24 minutes and 23 seconds. If everybody remembers, that magic time of possession number that I talked about all week was 27 minutes. And once Ole Miss gets over there, the defense is better than when you don't. So the defense was on the field quite a bit. If you look at total number of plays, 33 passes, 33 runs, 66 plays. That's not enough. Ole Miss's goal would have been between 75 and 85 against this defense. Um, Jimbo and Texas A&M had nearly 80 plays. They did a really good job of chewing up the clock in the second half, and Bobby Petrino got into his bag a little bit, and 
they were they started rolling. In the first half, Ole Miss completely dominated, but in the second half, A and M started rolling. So if A and M can build on this, they probably can beat some teams um, this season. They they can probably beat teams this season um, with if their offense plays like that. Max Johnson got completely beat up. Um, and Ole Miss dropped several interceptions in this game. Ole Miss could have had four picks in this game. Um, but the way it stands, a blocked field goal on the final kick by Xavion Harris. Man, it feels good to have a six foot seven defensive lineman come in, got a finger on the ball. I think he blocked, believe it or not, I don't know if we can do this, but I think Xavion Harris also had a block in the real true game last year against Kentucky. It seems like that happened to where Xavion Harris blocked field goals in both games as well. Now, this sets up a magical thing. The biggest game in Ole Miss history is set up for next Saturday, as long as Georgia can pull it out. They're only up three to nothing, by the way, on Missouri right now. And OU and Oklahoma State is tied. Penn State's barely beating Maryland as well. So, we get to enjoy our college football Saturday, and this is a fun Saturday to get to do that. And I'm going to open up the comments real quick um, just to see everything that's going on. We're going to stop so I didn't miss it. Um, let's see. I, I'm losing my mental, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, Cody Camp with that one. Kim Walters, wow. Um, Tony Pierce with what a game. If it wasn't for that block field goal in the first half, the game would have been more wide open. I had so many flashbacks just then, but somehow a different result this time. It Honestly, it was really similar to the LSU game, except it was a field goal to tie the game instead of us being up a four. It was very similar to the last of the LSU game. Wasn't a good day for Pete Goldie. Bobby Petrino exposed some stuff that he needs to get cleaned up because next week's offense is pretty good. Uh, but it's probably good that that is getting put on film because this is the realistic thing about what's going on. Ole Miss just played the perfect scout team for Georgia. The important thing was to win this game, but the talent level is going to be similar. So the things that you were doing against that level of talent, you can kind of do that against Georgia next week. And by the end of the game, you can saw that Lane and them, when they do their quick stuff, really quick, get the ball out of Jackson Dart's hand to where the defensive line cannot just hone in on a spot. You know, we you've seen us get predictable. And all of a sudden, it's run, run, and then pass the ball. And on that pass, it's going to be a second or third level RPO. The quarterback's going to hold the ball for two and a half seconds, and it's all going to be seven to eight yards behind the line of scrimmage. If the defensive line knows that, they can get home. But if you change the timing up, and then you didn't necessarily change the spot up, but if you change the timing up through jet sweeps and, and toss sweeps and pop passes and bubbles and slants and all of that, the defense gets really off balance. And when this defense gets off balance against this offense, and I am talking really, really fast right now, but I'm excited. I've got so much, like, just energy at the moment. Um, if you can do that, this offense, is you just can't stop it. This is the best defense in the SEC, and you made them look like LSU a couple of weeks ago. The only person that could stop the offense when we're running like this is us. And we did on that block field goal. It's because there was 30 yards or something in penalties that led to the block field goal. Craig Murray says, big payday for the refs. Yeah, it did feel like that was one-sided, although at the end where they did review it and say it was a catch when he was going out of bounds, it actually was. Uh, Mr. T um, Tap out, 26 says, hotty toddy, the anxiety has been real. <laughs> Face blue, wide eyes. Harry Walker says, hotty toddy, what a game, I need an IV. Yeah, as soon as this is over, I'm going to sit on the couch and just do nothing for about 12 hours. Or more than that, because it, this isn't a night game. 18 hours, I'm going to do nothing. And it, this this game just took it out of me. Um, Kim Walters says this get, this team just knows how to win. They don't pack it in like the past. Yeah, it's starting to see. This is a special team. And I'm going to need everybody's help on this one, okay? And it's obviously working with what's going on. But after the Alabama game, I watched Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny before LSU. And the offense was unstoppable and almost beat LSU. 
And every Friday since then, I've watched Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny because I'm doing my part. I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. But Georgia's the, going to be the number one team in the country, potentially. And, uh, and you have a situation that Ole Miss might need a little help. So I do encourage everybody on Friday to watch Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Go on Amazon Prime or whoever it is and get that movie and watch it so that we can have even more of this good luck thing amplified onto our Ole Miss Rebels. Because obviously, this is Ole Miss football or the college football game of destiny is now on tap because Ole Miss playing Georgia, this is the biggest game and. The only one that comes close is the Maryland game from 1952 that announced Vaught's arrival onto the scene. Ole Miss won that game 21-14. It was in Oxford. This being a road game, it's going to be more difficult. But this is the first of major real big games. And if Georgia wins the game today, and they even said it on college game day today, if Ole Miss wins and Georgia wins, that is going to be game day next weekend. It is going to be the biggest game in college football. That weekend, two top 10 teams. Ole Miss should move up quite a bit as well. If we have those miscues in the red zone against Georgia, not good. Clean it up, guys. This is the thing, Tony. You can't play football like that. It, it, what happens last week does not happen the next week. It, it, it just doesn't. You can say if that happens, and that is absolutely the case, but that it never works out that way. The spread was spot on, not, not just on the points. Never apologize for a dub. 8-1 going to Athens is our best-case scenario. Can't ask much for much more than that. Great job, Rebels. Access Bowl is on the table. Ole Miss is going to be favored against ULM. Ole Miss is going to be favored against Mississippi State. And they have the ultimate of all ultimate free shots for a chance at the playoff to advance in the SEC world. All of that is going to be absolutely huge for Ole Miss football. Reminds me of the heart attack team we had pre-2000. That was in 1990, 1989. That was the John Darnell team. I remember that. I remember his what, about 30-yard pass to Reed Hines. I remember the Rich Jebbia touchdown against Tulane. There was also a pass that was dropped um, in the end zone against LSU. And I think there was one more that year. That was truly the cardiac revs as well. SEC off Offensive Player of the Week from Infuriated Sloth, Trey Harris. That is correct. Just, just pack it up and get it to him. Dion Guitar said, someone needs to investigate that ref cure. That, like I said, it seemed one-sided, but it didn't seem like it needed to be one-sided, if that makes sense. That catch that they overturned on Anaya Smith, the, the point of the ball, he didn't have control of it because it moved after it hit the ground. He did not have that. Mike Big says, I'm glad we beat AM and the officials. Took seven points on the board with another phantom holding call. Should have been 21 to nothing. And then it would have been a boat race. Yes, absolute domination in the first half. Uh, Jim Loving, why does Ole Miss get so many holding calls? Um, I don't know. Um, and it usually happens whenever Ole Miss is playing Alabama, LSU, and Texas A&M. So maybe it's just because the other team are really talented. But maybe it's just because of the expectation if they're getting blocked, something had to happen, if that makes sense. Yeah. Donna Taylor says, I thought I was having a heart attack. Me too, Donna. Me too. My goodness. my I was shaking after the game. And I realized that I'd done nothing for my live stream at that point. Uh, but it was a great win. Eight and one Rebels. Tony Pierce. Me too. I could hear my heart beat in my ear. That's... That, that's probably a blood pressure thing. You might need to take a walk, Tony. Um, Randy Cross says, how do you feel about playing Georgia after the win um, against A&M? Oh, I love it. I, I was I'm on record as saying before this game, if Ole Miss won the game by one point, I was okay with it. Absolutely okay. I didn't care about spreads. This was a game that Ole Miss needed to get through. This honestly was a more extreme version of Vandy as far as what the game meant. Because the real game that everybody's talking about, and we were talking about it even during the week, is the game against the Georgia Bulldogs. And Georgia's good. Georgia's re really good. To the point where I'm going to do my Why Ole Miss Wins video on Friday against Georgia. And it's, it's going to be 
it, it, it's going to be difficult for me to come out with it because they are good. Carson Beck is really good as well. Chris Wilson says, um, holy crap, Steven. I think I had a minor heart attack. We we all did. We all did, bud. Mike Biggs, why can't our secondary hold on to interceptions? We dropped no less than four this game. Don't forget about in the LSU game. I think they dropped one or two in that comeback as well. Troy Davis says, good God, I love my Rebels to death, and I should be used to these type of games by now, but I swear when they happen, it's like the first time every time. Great win for the team and fans. Also, I do feel bad for Texas A&M. For a team that hasn't won a game on the road in two years, they actually came out in the second half and played a good football t- game to the point where they might you might argue that they deserve to win the game with the way they played. They executed their game plan flawlessly. The problem is Jackson Dart is just an elite, elite quarterback. And he just makes plays every time. Any Like I said, any time a question is asked to Jackson Dart, he answers it. You get your answer. Against LSU, when he got the ball in the old 12-yard line, everybody knew he was going to score. This time, everybody knew Ole Miss was going to score. And this was played against the number one defense in the SEC, even better than Georgia's defense. And he just calmly let him down the field for a touchdown. He is clutch. He is so clutch as a quarterback. Why couldn't our defense get a stop, uh, stop the run in the second half? I think what is what was going on, A, Texas A&M hopped in 12 personnel in the second half. But they didn't run typical two tight end um, formations. And having the extra blocker on the field allowed them to just get physical and go. And whenever Ole Miss is trying to defend the pass, Jared Ivey moves down into three technique as an interior defensive lineman, which means it's 265, 265, 265 across the front line. And then you have J.J. Pegues. And I think Bobby Petrino rightfully realized that you could probably lean on that group whenever Ole Miss got in that personnel group. And towards the end of the game, you saw more Xavier Harris, but at that point, A&M had confidence. And I tell you all the time, confidence is the most important thing in college sports, and there's nothing you can do without it. And once A&M started to realize they could move the ball in Ole Miss, they started to move the ball in Ole Miss. And Bobby Petrino got into his bag and started to figure out areas that he could attack. And um, honestly, Pete Golding started just spinning a little bit. At the end of the game, they just were doing zero blitzes. And I'm, I I've, I could see them breaking a tackle whenever they were doing it. But, you know, they got off the field. They won a big block field goal by Xavier and Harris. Um, best D-line money can buy. Exactly. Yeah, th- those are some dudes. These phantom holding calls by Cheesy Crust Pizza have gotten out of hand. Defense kind of gave up in the second half, but that offense looks amazing. I think the offense, you can count on the offense to look similar to that against Georgia next week. Because I think what you see is when Lane has a reason to be scared of and respect the defensive line of the other team, you see all the quick stuff and the offense that looked like LSU and A&M because they tried the other way against Alabama, and that defensive line shut them down. So Lane's ego, he is pretty quick to say, okay, we that doesn't work. So whenever there's a defensive line that he truly respects, like LSU, like um, A&M, like Georgia, it's going to be some more quick stuff. And my goodness, that quick stuff just opened everything up. Trey Harris does not have the day that he has – without them worry about those middle middle zones. And right on cue, Donna Taylor, Trey Harris was the dude. Yes, he was absolutely the dude. Like I said, he made two of the most unbelievable one-handed catches I've ever seen. It was like back-to-back plays almost of Odell Beckham. It, it, was, it was nuts. Mike Big says, still wish our defensive backs would turn around. A nice catch on Bray and him on the goal line would have easily been knocked down if our guy had turned around. Yeah, the problem with that is whenever – you are at the point where the other guy is beating you, which in that case, the lead position was Anaya Smith. It is hard to turn your head around because you want to keep your eye on where the guy is. Because if you turn your head around and Anaya Smith like drifts off to the back of the end zone, he's wide open. So that, that's the reason they don't do that. And they also have people that teach the technique of going after the hand when it shows. But Anaya Smith didn't catch that ball anyway. But, hey, it happens. 
Scorchio Gray says that that Tiki Tack holding call was not only a 10 point swing, but it absolutely destroyed our momentum 21 0 and so much else lost because of the Tiki Tack. If not for that, we see Spencer Sanders in the second half. Yes. In the first half, Ole Miss absolutely dominated that game. And they're probably lucky they did absolutely dominate that game. Uh, North Korean marching band can't help them cult boys now. Yes. Um, and by the way, my Why Ole Miss Wins episode that I do on Friday, and I do that every Friday, but whenever I, Ole Miss plays in a close game to where the other team wants to basically essentially bookmark it, it goes crazy. During the game, I got 1,300 views on that video. And I guarantee you that was Texas A&M people getting ready to comment on them. Um, but, yes, I, I'm going to do the Why Ole Miss Wins episode against Georgia. Like I said, I'm going to have to dig for stuff, but – I am going to do it because it's the ultimate of ultimate free shots. Maximum inebriation for the remainder of the day. Hottie toddy, Ivan Edward. Yeah. Enjoy it, man. I'm going to have a beer whenever this um, live stream ends because I'm excited. This, this Ole Miss team is just special, man. It's special. I understand that we have three national championships and that period between 57 and 63 happened. I get that for my age group that never saw that I was born 13 years after 63 this is the best football team in my lifetime and I told everybody and anybody that has watched the show I said this is the most talented team in my lifetime so at least they're playing like their talent is unlike last year where they had a little bit of issue potentially throwing the ball but Jackson Dart got that air raid out of his system and my goodness, he's 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 just a dude. He is just a dude. Missouri, by the way, is up on Georgia seven to three at the start, early in the second quarter, but Georgia's in the red zone. If Georgia blows this for Ole Miss, I'm going to be pissed. Honestly, on this is nuts. Um, Joshua Triplett, hell yeah, Ivan, um, Luke Shaw. Those calls and reviews were insane. Yeah, the there was a couple of them, and and, and like Deshaun Getty didn't catch that interception. At which he also was the one that dropped the interception against LSU. Um, the catch by Walker on the sideline on the last drive, that was actually a catch, not an incomplete pass. But the Anaya Smith review, there was no way there was enough, enough on that review to um, overturn the call, period. Trey Harris was an absolute unit. Uh, ben Harris, good call, Steven. Um, yeah. Thomas Summerall, I hate this Rebel team. So inconsistent, so bad, boring pattern of disappearing every week. We'll be... Jesus, Thomas. <laughs> uh, buddy, if you can't enjoy this football season, if you hate this Ole Miss team, uh, were you more comfortable with Steve Sloan? I, I don't understand that. You're going to get in there, Thomas. What are, what are you looking for? Are you, look, are, are, are you just the person that's looking for basically what George has been doing? Is that it? Uh, because, it, it, the, yeah, that one doesn't make any sense, buddy. I like you, but it, it, that doesn't make sense. Luke Shaw says, I don't know how our guys kept their composure and continued to play their best. I was losing my mind. Yeah, I was shaking, literally shaking. I had to build, like, a background really quick, and that's the reason Jackson Dart is the dude. Trey Harris is the dude. How many interceptions were dropped? That's the reason is that. It's because, like, oh, crap i forgot to do that and so i had to go in and get it done real quick like right before we started streaming donnie clark says bad officials bad defense um coach defensive coach poor job yeah i i'm sure pete golding um is not high on what happened but um hey almost won the game it's a lot better to go in there and clean that up get ready for georgia because you have a situation with Okay, we just went against those guys. Now we're going against these guys. And these guys are legit. These guys haven't lost since like 2021. And you have that, and you have that ability to play that game. That helps. Jason Simmons from Dead Soxy. Yeah, looking back there, Dead Soxy. Um, hottie freaking tidy. Go Rebels. Um, yeah, I mean, we're almost at the point now where if Ole Miss just goes chalk the rest of the way, they're in the Orange Bowl. I mean, that's it. I mean, if even if they lose to Georgia and win the last two, they're in the the Orange Bowl or the Peach Bowl. Um, honestly, 
if they lose to Georgia and Mississippi State, which isn't going to happen, they're in the Citrus Bowl. So we are at a point where a bowl game that you have never been to likely. I don't, I don't necessarily care for the Peach Bowl. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope, I'm hoping Ole Miss goes to the Orange Bowl personally. Uh, Joshua Triplett, I go upstairs and watch on my phone under the covers the entire 14, <laughs> whatever it takes for the Rebels to win. Exactly. If You may not be superstitious, but you're a little stitious. And everybody Friday, watch Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Amplify my good luck. I've been doing that every game since before LSU. After Alabama, I started that. On Fridays, I watch that movie. It's gotten to the point now where I can almost quote it. Uh, but everybody needs to um, help me amplify that. I'm thinking about making a shirt that just says um, Ole Miss football and the game of destiny um, for this weekend. My whole head is gray hair now. Uh, I wish I could blame that on the game, honestly. Um, been watching Rebel football for 40 years, Jack Leslie said. Ole Miss doesn't usually win in those situations, and this year Ole Miss doesn't lose in those situations. Ben Harris says, well, Mr. Summerall, Ole Miss is 8-1. and one. Yeah, that, that's kind of my point. We should have won by 31, and we were about three plays from doing just that. That is absolutely correct. Scott Bailey says, what a game. Texas A&M gave us a real run for our money. I'm so proud of the Rebels. Let's keep this momentum going, and hopefully we will have a chance at Georgia. The freest of free shots, the biggest game. I have been jealous of my father my whole life. Because my father got to live through the 50s. He got to see these amazing, magical games before. The biggest game in my lifetime that I saw was probably the Ole Miss and LSU game in 2003. But that wasn't a game to where Ole Miss can elevate its standing, its tier. Much in the similar way that Clemson did previously. That game, Ole Miss already had a loss to Memphis and a loss to Texas Tech. It was a two-loss team. They they were going to the Cotton Bowl pretty much regardless. Um, Because I think it wasn't the Sugar Bowl. Yeah, the Sugar Bowl was like the national championship game because Ole Miss wasn't playing in that. So, I mean, it kind of is what it is. This is a tear changer. This is a self-identifying changer that Ole Miss is dealing with. This is a chance for Ole Miss to quit being just a good program and start being viewed as a great program. Not elite yet, not elite, but there were still a couple of tiers that Ole Miss had to hit up between in the meantime. And, and Ole Miss has a shot against Georgia to win that game. They do. Just a realistic shot to beat Georgia. Georgia's going to be favored by 15 to 16 points. It's going to be a free shot. All of that stuff is true. But if Ole Miss can win that game and have a shot for the playoff, okay, and have a shot for the playoff, at that point, I think we need to cease worrying about Lane Kiffin going anywhere ever again at any location. Because the only thing that other schools have over Ole Miss, because Ole Miss is paying $9 million a year. It's not money now. I'd like to think that people in Oxford, Mississippi, that make $9 million a year can live a pretty good life. But the question is, can Ole Miss do it there at the highest level? If Ole Miss is in the conversation for the playoff and it's only a bad half of football against Alabama, because I truly think Ole Miss beats Alabama right now. As good as improved as Jalen Milrow is, I think this Ole Miss team now beats Alabama. And if that happens and you have the the internal identity issue going on to where we can do that. We are a playoff program. Hey, we're going to 12 teams next year. There's no reason to even look around. It becomes completely about building your own brand. And I'm telling you, this is an unbelievably massive game this weekend. And we're going to talk about it over and over again. I'm trying to think of guests and things like that. And Shark Tank Live, I've got, um, I'm going to get, I think, Brad Logan on the show to talk about it. And I'm also going to try and like get Corey Burton and all of that. It should be pretty cool indeed. Oh, man. Awesome. Jack Leslie says, proud of the Rebels. Um, what is Texas A&M's record? Now they're five and four. They're not bowl eligible at the moment. So now Texas eight and four gets to continue to be a thing, by the way, which we're all 
we're all in favor of that. Luke Shaw says, glory to God, we won the game with a skull and crossbows emoji. Ashley Reed said, I had three heart attacks and 13 beers. Hotty toddy, gosh, amati. That was a game. Ashley, I had no idea you were in Wisconsin. That was a super fans joke, but hey, I hope everybody likes that. This week, we played so much better in the first half and the second half. True. Yeah, and the thing just went out there. Mizzou just scored. So I'm a little bit behind catching up. I wonder if we can collect funds from Ole Miss for mental breakdown, right? Cody Camp, my heart just slowed down. Uh, Trey Harris is the dude. Donna, Donna Taylor. Every Hey, I always talk about give Jordan Watkins all the NIL money. Well, now split it with Trey Harris. J, um, Jordan Watkins had his moment. Um, huge, huge calls by, by the ref against us almost cost us. It's right. Yeah. But the, the officials can stop us, but we're not playing the oh, – wait, wait. Let me take that back. We're not supposed to play the officials, so we can't count on that. Marcus Hopkins says, pretty sure my neighbors from a half a mile away um, heard we won at the block field goal. Harry Gong just got off the plane and got results. The flags have got to stop. This is absurd. Yeah. Oh, uh, especially this weekend. And with Georgia being the team that – especially – okay, I'll put it to you like this. If you want conspiracy theories, if everybody wants conspiracy theories, here's your one. If LSU beats Alabama tonight, okay, and it looks like LSU or Ole Miss, or mainly LSU because it's harder for Ole Miss to get to the SEC championship game than the playoff because reasons uh, – you're going to see a situation that the referees call that Georgia game tight. You just are. You're going to see holding penalties and things like that. It's going to be a low, leave no doubt moment because here's the thing. I am convinced that if Ole Miss goes 11 and one and does not make the playoffs, they do not make. They're not going to make the college football playoff and does if they don't make the SEC championship game. If there's a way they can screw Ole Miss, they will. So, if Alabama loses to LSU and their playoff is gone. There's only three teams that have a chance to make the playoff, not including Missouri, if they can pull off a win today. All of a sudden, you're going to see them. They're going to help Georgia. They just are. Georgia's going to come into that game, what, number one in the country? Because Ohio State looked like crap today, if I'm not mistaken. And if that happens, I think you have to be wary, at least, of what the calls could be. Although, I do love what they did today in the quick passing game. Like I said, me and Bill Flowers against LSU, we called for it. We got it. Ole Miss against offense, LSU's off defense was unstoppable. Everybody talked about LSU's defense not being good. Against Texas A&M, we saw it again. And Ole Miss's offense was unstoppable. The only thing that could stop them was flags and Ole Miss stopping themselves. It wasn't Texas A&M that did it. Even on the play where Ole Miss went three and out, that Texas A&M eventually – got the lead on Ole Miss on, it was obvious pass interference. The guy got there like a beat early. But Ole Miss won the game, just win the game, and Ole Miss fans should be really excited about where they stand right now. They're going to come into the college football playoff rankings. Texas and Kansas State went to overtime. So I have to think Texas is going to drop down a little bit. There's a chance that LSU is going to beat Alabama. Oklahoma State, I think, is beating Oklahoma right now. There's a chance that USC beats Washington. There's a chance Tuesday night is really fun for Ole Miss football. But I do want to caution everybody. Do not look at these rankings as linear. One week does not matter to the other. Ole Miss could win against Mississippi State and be fourth or third in the country and then not go to the SEC championship game and end up fifth like TCU did in 2014. Just know that these rankings are completely separate ent entities and they're not linked. That's kind of important to remember. I missed a lot. Uh, let's see. Um, Q had about 103 yards and three touchdowns. Do you think our um, chances are beating Georgia or less if Mizzou beats them? No, actually. Because then you become it becomes a situation where they're they're wounded, they're they're really hurt, the confidence goes down. You're going to get the best version of Georgia 
whenever they can actually get up for what they're doing. If Missouri beats them, you're not going to get the best. You're, there's going to be a loss letdown. There's a chance that Missouri beats this team twice because they haven't lost. They don't know how to do it. Why not pray while you watch the movie? Then, well, Ben, then I'll miss the movie. I enjoy the movie. It's a good movie. I like it. Any Indiana Jones movies that the bad guys are Nazis are infinitely superior than the other movies. It, it just is. It's like um, Last Crusade is the number one. Number two is Raiders of the Lost Ark. And number three is Dial of Destiny. And then you have Temple of Doom. And then you have King, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Whenever the Nazis are not the central villain of the um, movie, you have a situation that's just not as good for whatever reason. Maybe we need that supernatural um, ability. Jack Leslie, you got to believe. Yeah, exactly. Um, Cash the Real Saint says, I think we are... Um, we too appreciate what Lane Kiffin has done with this team more than we have because I don't know of any coach besides Smart and Saban that can do what he done with this program. Yeah, Lane Kiffin is he he's worth his money. Worth his money. Yeah, the over under is seven and five was a no brainer, sweet win. Yeah, it, whenever that came out and Ole Miss's over under was a seven and five, I was like, who wants free money? Therapy grind with that one. Welcome back, therapy. By the way. Um, with the slightest push, we could have won that game by 31. Yeah. Seems Pete Golding was off today. I, I think that was more of a situation that De Texas A&M did some things a little bit differently. They did some max protect stuff. There was a situation where they only sent three people on the route. They did some 12 personnel. And Texas A&M started getting confident. And it, at a while, basically what you saw from Texas A&M was what Georgia Tech did against Ole Miss. That was the Georgia Tech game plan. The difference is Texas A&M does have better players than Georgia Tech. And the irony is Haynes King um, is the quarterback of Georgia Tech. Just too many penalties. This game should not have been close. I'm leaving the vault right now. Talk about an officiating crap show. Yeah, I, um, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Just got off the plane, saw the final score. Hotty toddy, way to go Rebs. Defense stood tall when we needed them to at most again. Yeah, Pete Golding figured it out. He gets a stop when he needs to get a stop. Jackson Dart has a drive when he needs to make a drive. Pretty cool stuff. Will be difficult to beat Georgia if Mississippi keeps getting penalties on critical downs. Yeah, but they got like four of them in a row. So most of them are actually on one drive. Some of y'all must have been wearing your game day socks, hotty toddy. Yes, dead socks in the house. Jason Simmons coming in here and doing it. Um, we're working on something right now. If Ole Miss gets near, near me, I think we're going to do a meetup for people that watch the show and maybe do something in conjunction with those guys. I, I don't know. It's still a long way to go on that and has to have to see what happens. But I, I do think something needs to happen because, um, um, honestly, I, I want to meet Jason Simmons and um, you guys that watch the show. So we need to figure something out as well. Cash the Real Saint says every game is not going perfect, but you never complain about being 81, 8 and 1 and th scoring 38 points. Yes, you are absolutely correct on that one. Cameron Hall says Walton, the corner, definitely got banged up in this game. Hope you'll be fine for Georgia. Um, there's two players that I'm concerned about. Um, I do want, um, they're both Georgia Tech transfers. Walton and Jared Ivey, because Jared Ivey limped off on that last drive. And so I'll be interested about that. We won't hear about it at all. Um, Anthony's breakup should have stood as incomplete. Yes. Craig Murray says, the only heart attacks I have had watching Ole Miss play is when I heard Corvick need back deep for the Rebels. Yeah, that's pretty good. Jordan Watkins at punt return has been a revelation, like first time in 10 years revelation. These particular refs always call things against us when they should. I probably should pay attention more to who's calling the game, honestly. Luke Shaw says at least three of the holding calls were flat wrong. Yeah. I, th I think it's just because sometimes um, Micah Pettis and those guys just dominate a guy. And they was like, well, something had to happen there. It's kind of like that defensive holding call where basically Anaya Smith just did a spin move and they called holding. Crazy. Need to wear white gloves when at home. 
the bright blue gloves show up too easy on white jerseys. The refs can see the grip. He's not wrong. Scorcho Gray with that one. Option causes holds. Yeah, running the option on the last play, that that was a great play call. It, it just was. By the way, um, I think Oklahoma State's going to boat roast Oklahoma in this game. It's 14 to 7 at the moment. Georgia's currently up 10 to nothing or 10 to 7. So we'll see about that. Do we stay at 10 or move up? I think we move up. I, I think we're in there. This was a game that was an unbelievably tricky game. It wasn't a trap game because AM was good, but it was a tricky game because of what was coming. I mean, you're you have potentially the biggest game in the history of your school coming up in seven days. Now go pay attention against the five and three teams with top five talent. This game could have gone oh so wrong, and in other years it would have. Chance Gray, are we pulling for Georgia or Mizzou? Georgia, I think. Um, Mizzou needs to lose a couple of times because you get into the question about the access bowls um, if it happens. I'd like to see Mizzou good enough to get to the Citrus Bowl or out, you know, something like that. How about them eight and one Rebs? Everything is in front of us. Listen to this. In 2022, Ole Miss was 8-1. and one. In 2023, Ole Miss was 8-1. and one. Back-to-back years. We are entering a glory days, period. Now, Ole Miss needs to win something. That window's open. But Ole Miss needs to win something. Jason's doing some solid advertising in the stream right now. His dead socksy socks is going on. Jason's pretty fired up right now because I think he knows what this means. Um, Gage, I've never been so relieved. You are absolutely right. Mike Vandegrift, let's go OK State. Yeah, this is a game that this being the last Bedlam game and it's at OK State, OK State wasn't losing this game. And Oklahoma is going to pay for this. And Texas is about to drop down too. I think there's a chance, especially if LSU beats Alabama, you could wake up with Ole Miss seventh in the country um, next week, the way it sits right now. Dart, 24 33, 387 yards, two touchdowns. Judkins, 23 carries, 102 yards, three touchdowns. Trey Harris, 11 catches, 213 yards, one touchdown. That might be the best stat line for an Ole Miss game I've ever seen. Just period. Just three guys that absolutely dominated the game against the number one defense in the SEC. Let's not forget that those are some dudes over there. Although um, Darden doing the uppercut into Micah Pettis' nuts and then throwing a right cross is one of the dumbest things I've seen recently. Yeah, I heard that Aishim is off the roster. I think um, 247 reported that earlier today. Aishim was a dude that didn't really fit anyway. He was one of the Chris Parchers guys that was a second transfer player. Um, Trey Washington kind of took his position and took his playing time, and he became kind of discontented. I think we saw the potential that this team can be great. They haven't quite put it together for a whole game yet, but if we play four quarters like we did the first quarter, it's playoff time. And wouldn't next week be the right week to do that, honestly? Wouldn't next week be the right week to put it all together? If you if you were trying to think of a perfect opportunity, if you want a team to put it all together, yes, you it's next week, right? Because you have better talent than um, Louisiana Monroe. You have better talent than Mississippi State. The, the big game is the big game. Everybody is going to be focused on this Georgia game. Everybody is going to be focused on this Georgia game moving forward. And I mean, Missouri's a good football team, by the way. They're just a good football team. And yeah, it this this could get a little bit hairy because if Missouri upsets Georgia, now how awesome would it be to have like a Missouri versus Ole Miss SEC championship game? That would be kind of funny. That would that would be fun. Super clutch final drive by the offense. Yes, Jackson Dart and my. If anybody is looking for me to complain about Jackson Dart, okay. If anybody is looking for that, find something else to watch. 
I am a Jackson Dart fanboy. I have Bill Flowers who comes in to keep me a little bit grounded, although I think I know a lot about football. It's good to have somebody's perspective that comes in and can tell me certain things because I, I, it can't just be my perspective. But this is the most clutch quarterback that has ever played at Ole Miss. Period. And if he wins Saturday, he starts going up the charts towards greatest of all time. If you have an 11 and 1 Jackson Dart who comes back for a senior year and gets Ole Miss in a playoff game, he's the greatest of all time that ever played at Ole Miss. And your childhood memories and everything, that might be great and everything's good to go. But yeah. You're you're at a very, very, very intense time for Ole Miss football. Sitting on the 50-yard line was in stain. Yeah, congratulations. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, Corey Porter says that's why defensive backs play defense and not wide receiver because they can't catch. Otherwise, they'd be on offensive side of the ball, just as good athletes as wide receivers, not as good as catching. How the team didn't get frustrated and kept playing their best was truly elite. Yeah. This team is one of the first Ole Miss teams that actually has the play the next play mindset. It, it, it just doesn't matter. They're such even killed. There's no up and down. You know, we always used to make fun of like Nick Saban coach teams being robotic. They're, they're robots and everything. You're worried about that. This team is starting to look like that to where you can count on the effort each and every week. And I think that's probably Pete Golding's influence because he's used to that. Quit sending pressure in the second half. A AEC P 2 L. Um, I agree with that, but at the end they had to send pressure because it just wasn't working. Craig Murray feed Trey. Yes. Do we need somebody to do a song, right? Um, you know, feed Moncrief, feed Trey. I, I see a lot of Dante Moncrief in Trey's game, a little bit of a pre-injury look along. His catch radius is insane. His athleticism is pretty off the charts, too. And he, he's just a weapon on the outside. There's not many people that can deal with it. Missouri's driving the ball again. Rex Thompson says, great win for the Rebels. I was hoping for a better effort from the defense, but the team as a whole played hard. You did get a decent effort from the defense in the first half, honestly. They only had 120 yards of offense, and like 50 of it was on that last touchdown drive. So like their four, first four possessions, the defense was pretty dominant. Um, and honestly, Ole Miss doesn't win this game without that. It just – the stops weren't coming at the end. This time they just came at the beginning. Um, when he when he gets food, feed, feed, feed Q, right? Shout out to Max Johnson. The dude was under legit pressure. Yeah. It's like I told people, everybody liked to say he, he was a statue all week. And I was like, that that's not really the case because he's so good at moving the ball and giving ground and kind of functioning in the pocket and stuff like that. Like I said, his zone read game is not overly great, um, but he, he moved around just enough that caused a problem in the past game. He did kind of throw some balls up for grabs and Ole Miss should have picked them all. Luke Shaw says Trey and Dayton are the most underrated receivers in college football. Don't forget Jordan Watkins, by the way. Special teams did not look good. You're right. That'll make the difference. Yeah. It, the special teams against Georgia could be the, the part of the game that gets Ole Miss beat. That, that is a legit weakness. It, between They've had two kicks blocked this year. Um, their punt game is the ultimate off, off and on. Um, their return game is pretty good, um, but the the punting and kicking game is, is not my favorite at the moment. Pokey says, glad that's over. Connor Callahan said, how's concerning um, that we slow down at the end of the second and quarter? Um, yet yeah, our middle eight minutes are usually really concerning, but the third quarter in the middle eight minutes, we go down and score a touchdown, we get the interception. Um Honestly, that was the winning play, by the way, that interception by John Saunders, um, that mental eight minutes. But it is concerning. The middle part of the game is probably the area you can nitpick the most. Trey Harris had not been injured those few games, the number one receiver in college football. I agree. If he was not injured, we beat Alabama. 
honestly. Felt a lot like the Kentucky game this year or last year. And yeah, it did. And that's not even saying anything about the uniforms Ole Miss was wearing. Number nine for Heisman, Perry, great player. I wouldn't trade him for any other receiver in college football. You want Georgia to win so that our potential win against them is better. Plus, you don't want to play against a pissed Georgia team looking to rebound against us in Athens. Jay Cannon says, at one time we had three quarterbacks on the field today. Yeah, Walker Howard got a snap in non-garbage time today. He absolutely did. And finally, Quinshawn quietly went over 100 yards after the slow start, and his run runs were key on our drives when he got going. This Ole Miss team is special, 8-1. and one. This doesn't feel like last year. Everybody's going to say, well, this team went 8-1 last year. And this in no way feels like last year. You have a situation to where Ole Miss against Georgia is the freest of free shots. And if you can handle those free shots against Georgia, all of a sudden you are going to be looking at a different level of not just your program, your recruiting. By the way, um, Caleb Odom was in the stadium today. A couple of four-star commits were in the stadium today. That atmosphere was absolutely raucous and amazing. Ole Miss ended up getting the win. They're, they're getting in the locker room right now, celebrating with the team. Today was nothing but a good day, and the freest of the free shots are on hand. Ole Miss has three games left in the season, and what appears to be a New York Six type ball game. Pretty cool, pretty heady stuff. Should be pretty great. Anyway, thanks again for making the Locked On Almost podcast your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast. We are going to do our live stream, Sharp Talk Tank Live, Tuesday night. Tune in for that. If you have subscribed, tell a friend, get them to. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And if you listen to this on one of the other mediums besides YouTube, go to YouTube and subscribe to the channel. We'd appreciate it. We're trying to grow this up really, really quickly because if we get to 6,000 subscribers, I'm going to do remote broadcasts. So we'll be doing the episodes of the show from, say, the Orange Bowl or wherever Ole Miss might be. Um, we're, we're going to try to do something like that as well. But thank you for tuning in. Enjoy football. We get to sit back and enjoy this day. And this is awesome. Ole Miss a 38-35 to 35 winner over Texas A&M. Feels good. Eight and one. We are in the glory days. Jackson Dart is unbelievable clutch. And we'll see you Monday. Take care.